I, I, I know why I was, was chosen as the, the chair of the session. Actually, uh, of the NCTS. Actually, I'm the postdoc number one of NCTS. <laughs> That's 20 years ago. Okay, I can still remember uh, at that time uh, the hot summer and uh, the director Yen of the Joe Yen process, and I was the only or the only two uh, on the payrolls and plus a, a charming secretary. And uh, yeah, uh, but. It's, uh, it's hard to, to think that it's uh, already 20 years. And, uh, but uh, this NCTS is the brainchild, uh, it grow out of the vision and uh, wisdom and efforts of the late Darwin Chen. Uh, it's also, he is also a particle physicist. And uh, uh, if, if he were here, he would be very proud to see this center. It's becoming a uh, center of gravity and after our international research collaboration in Taiwan. You'll be very proud to see that. And we're glad that everybody are gathered together to uh, attend this uh, annual meeting. So, now move on to the last uh, lecture. Number of those uh, songs, we already did in high school, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> it's hard to imagine, and uh, actually very excited to know there is a modern perspective on these classic topics, the buildings, building stone of the modern particle physics. Uh, let's welcome Ian. Thank you. Since uh, we're in the mood of uh, revealing how old we are, when uh, John was uh, a postdoc 20 years ago, I was an undergraduate student running uh, from classroom to classroom in the building next to this uh, new building. So those were the dates. Okay. So now you know how old I am. Let me. Uh, I'll talk about Nambu Boson Bosons. But I think since I'm the last speaker, I should, uh, 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 on behalf of all the speakers, let's thank the local organizer for such a wonderful conference. <laughs> all right, so, so indeed, you know, today I'm going to talk about a very old subject. Uh, so since it's a very old subject, we all learned it from high school, and sometimes we all need to be reminded a little bit of what we learned uh, in high school. So just to set the notation, uh, let me begin with some very, very simple, you know, uh, 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 traditional treatment of an ampu So, so the, the textbook example start with the, the following Mexican hat potential. Uh, so here I'm just uh, giving you a, 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 a one complex scalar or two real scalar with a, a Mexican hat potential. And of course, uh, for people with condensed matter background, they, they know this as a Dinsko Landau potential. And when we have this potential, uh, uh, first we notice that uh, the potential has a two dimensional rotational symmetry around the z axis. Uh, but the ground state where the, at the bottom of the potential is not unique. Now it's a circle at the, with the ground state. And the ground state can be obtained by minimizing the potential energy. And you can characterize the ground state by the expectation value of the scalar field, uh, which uh, uh, is given parameterized by first the distance to the origin as well as the angle with respect to some uh, coordinate system. So you can really use uh, two number V and alpha, which is the angle to characterize the ground state of the system. Okay? And the distance to the, the origin is given by some parameter in your Mexican, Mexican hat potential, of course. Okay. So we know that you know, the, uh, there's an infinite number of ground state, all parameterized by the single parameter alpha, which is continuous parameter. But, uh, and also once uh, an alpha, or once the ground state is chosen, then the rotational invariance is broken. So we know this uh, uh, very well. And to see the number goes from both electricity, then it's best to uh, take your complex uh, scalar field and go to the, the polar coordinate, uh, where you write the, uh, the radial uh, direction using an excitation mode or rho, and your angular excitation, you use it uh, the notation pi of x. And in this particular parameterization, the ground state is at where your a uh, row, your radial mode has a vacuum expectation of V, and your angular mode, which is pi, can have an expectation value of alpha, which again depends on which ground state 
uh, you choose to sit in. Okay? And expanding respect to the ground state, then you can write down what is the uh, 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 effective uh, potential and effective interaction of this excitation above the, the, ground, the ground state here where your radio mode has an expectation view, V and your uh, interior mode has an expectation value alpha. And when you uh, explain with respect to the ground state, you plug it into the potential, you see that the interior mode uh, disappears from the potential. So that means that uh, this angular uh, uh, mode pi is masked. And this is a well-known uh, Nambu goes from bosom that we, uh, uh, we know. And OK, so this is a typical story. And moreover, the, from the kinetic term of the scalar field, again, you plug it into the rho and pi mode. You see that first, you, you see that uh, uh, all the alpha dependence will drop out. Whereas uh, 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 there is still some V dependence in your effective potential, okay? Uh, so this is, uh, 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 again, this is not surprising because under rotation by the theta angle, the expectation value of pi shift from pi alpha goes to alpha plus theta, okay? So this is how uh, uh, the rotation, the alpha expanded drop out, just to say that this is how the rotational inverse man manifests itself in your effective Lagrangian, even though you have chosen a ground state that specifically depends on the angle, angle alpha, but your, your effective Lagrangian does not depend on alpha. This is how you sort of recover the rotational inverse in this protocol. Okay, uh, and it, equivalently, you know, this rotation of the ground state by alpha goes to alpha plus theta, as you can see that the effect of this rotation on this pi field is to shift the pi field by a constant theta. Okay, so that means that you know, the rotational symmetry implies that the dynamics must be independent of this constant shift because this shift in your pi field is equivalent to choosing a different that vacuum of that theta. But your dynamics should not depend on this particular choice of vacuum, therefore, uh, your uh, dynamics must be independent of this constant shift in your pi, in pi goes to pi plus theta. And we call this uh, a shift symmetry. Again, this is uh, very well known. So in this example, the full symmetry group G of the system is a two-dimensional rotational symmetry, which is the U1. And the ground state uh, 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 for this uh, uh, pi field, uh, uh, once you've chosen a particular alpha, it breaks the U1 symmetry completely, and there is no residual symmetry that leaves the ground state invariant. Okay, and of course uh, uh, there could be more complica complicated cases. Uh, just if you use n uh, real scalar, then this uh, the, the broken group G is a rotational group in the n uh, uh, sp uh, dimensional rotation uh, group, and the unbroken symmetry is the n minus one dimensional uh, rotation. So. One last style of review is that now, so in this more complicated case, you can rewrite the ghost of mode again. Uh, in, there are many different ways to rewrite the ghost of mode. This is just one way to write the radio mode as square root of 1 minus pi squared. And then you, in your, uh, uh, your kinetic term, when you read the, uh, write it in terms of the pi mode, pi mode it becomes horribly uh, complicated and non-linear. Okay, again, this is a, a, a well know this as John said in high school. Uh, so here I just want to make a two key observations. First is that the interaction of the Nabu Boson photo in general, as you can see here, is, uh, is very, very nonlinear. Okay? Moreover, the Nabu Boson photons are always the rigid couple due to the shift symmetry. Okay, we know this. You know, uh, uh, so we use this term interchangeably that Nabu boson boson has a shift symmetry or the Nabu boson boson a derivative couple. Okay, it, it, it means the same thing. That, you know, a pi, they have a symmetry of pi goes to pi plus theta. Except that in this case, uh, when you have a, a slightly non, a, a, a non trivial group, the shift symmetry has some high order terms that we usually just write as dot, dot, dot. Okay, and this high order term in the shift symmetry, they are usually absent uh, uh, in a simple U1 case. But, you know, when you have more complicated uh, a group other than U1, 
there would be a correction or lots of correction to this shift symmetry and, and no one pretty much uh, uh, ever bothered to work it out and for very good reasons as I will explain to you later. Okay, but uh, the point of the, this uh, uh, review is just to, to cast this uh, shift symmetry as, uh, as a consequence of the general vacuum of your underlying view. Okay. And so more generally, they, it's a well-defined procedure to write out the who goes on effective action for arbitrary uh, group G in the UV and arbitrary group H in the infrared that goes, that was proposed, that was worked out by Kellen, Coleman, Kellen, West, and Domino back in the uh, 60s. And people usually just refer these to this as the CCWZ. And the general procedure requires prior knowledge of G and H, that is, you know, whatever effective action you write it down, you have to know what is the G in the UV, and what is the H, or what is the H in the IR. And if you follow the CCWZ procedure, different G and H would give you different effective action. Okay, that, that's just what, what, what it is, if you follow the, this procedure. And so the conventional wisdom is that the nonlinearity in the Nambu Goson interactions is due to the nonlinearly realized group G in the UV. That's just the term terminology, you know. We usually call H the unbroken group, and the group G that is broken in UV, we always say it, it's a, it's a nonlinearly realized group, and as a consequence, the Nambu Goson interactions are highly nonlinear. And just very quickly, just to demonstrate, uh, to make a contrast of, of, of what I want to talk about later, let me just quickly show you how the CCWZ uh, write down the effective energy. The CCWZ, the way they do it is that you know, once you choose a, 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 a G in the UV and H in the infrared, you write down your goldstone field in terms of this uh, exponential parameterization to see it into the i pi dot x. And this is just very similar to the way we write down the uh, a chiral boundary when you write the pi on this, it's e to the i pi, okay? And this object has a, a very complicated transmission property under the action of the full group G, okay? And under the full group G, this uh, pi on becomes a pi prime, pi prime, which depends on your original pi on and the group G that you're acting on it. But in general, this is a very, very complicated mess. It's so complicated that the CCWZ, they didn't want to deal with. So they find a way around it, okay? They didn't want to deal with this, uh, how does the pion transform under the action of G? So they say that, uh, uh, okay, this, uh, again, here just show you that where the usual shift image come from. If you take a G to be, again, uh, sit in the uh, broken uh, group, then the pion shift by a, a, a constant shift plus, again, dot, 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 that CCWZ, they just, don't want to deal with. Okay, so instead, of CCWZ look for objects that have simpler transformation property under the action of G, and these come from the so-called Cartan-Meyer one form. Just compute this uh, Cassi dagger DV Cassi that give you two objects. One is called D mu, one is called E mu. The D mu transform covariantly like uh, uh, under this uh, action of G. Okay, so it's called the Gaussian covariant derivative. The other object, E mu, transform like a gauge field, like this. And so these two have a well-defined transformation property under the action of G. Therefore, we can just write down the effective boundary without knowing how the pi transform under the action of G, because all we have to do is to construct these two objects, D and E, then they have well-defined transformation property, and they can build a complete effective abundance from these simple objects, E and E, okay? So in this fashion, CCWZ circumvents the problem of working out how the pion transform under the broken group G. This is really complicated, but CCW tells us that, you know, worry not. We don't have to worry about how this pion transform under uh, the, the broken group G, because we know we know D, we know E, so we have this goes of covariant derivative, and that's how, that's the only object we need to build the effective account, okay? And there is no need to work out this transformation problem, okay? 
And so in this, uh, uh, this is a very powerful approach, but it adopts a top-down perspective in the sense that uh, you need to know ahead of time what, what the broken group G is in the infrared in order to write down this uh, whole machinery. It also obscures the fact that the ghost on bosons, they are infrared degrees of freedom that connect different vacuum. Because it gives you a false sense of impression that the ghost on interaction depend on what's being broken in the ultraviolet G. Okay. And for, so just, again, just to really drive home uh, 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 the, the message, let me show you that uh, if you follow CCWG, uh, and then, let me show two different effective actions. Uh, so consider two different G and H, but both G and H, they will contain a number of bosons, boson that is a, a complex uh, a boson that is charged under U1 subgroup of H. Okay, so, so the simplest case you can right now take the G to be SU2, take your H to be U1. So when you break SU2 to U1, there is a complex boson that is charged under this U1. And following CCWG will give you this effective action for this U1 number goes on. Okay, if, if you look at it, there's a kinetic term, there's a dimension six term, there's dimension A, dimension 10, and so on and so forth. And then you can take a different G at different H and follow CCWG. For example, you can take this uh, G to be SU5, and you can take H to be SO5. And inside this area, so far, there's, again, there is an E1 subgroup, and you can just find a complex boson that is charged under any E1 subgroup of SO5, and you just use CCWZ to write down the effective action of this particular E1 that is charged under the E1 subgroup of SO5, and this is the, what the CCWZ gives you. Again, character, dimension 6, dimension 8, dimension 10. And indeed, when you look at this, uh, uh, the effective actions are different, <coughs> just following from CCWG. And again, you know, uh, uh, if you grew up like, like me learning this, you know, at a later stage, like in graduate school, then you say this is very natural. So that coefficient, 1 over 80,000, how difficult to calculate? Oh, if you have a computer program, that's... There's no nothing about loop, just uh, algebra. No, this is, this is just algebra. This is just extending exponential of these matrices to this over here. Okay, so let me just recap you know, the conventional wisdom from the past four decades about uh, a number goes on, goes on. So first of all, the spontaneous symmetry breaking occurs when the ground state is not invariant under the full symmetry of the group of the system. And uh, number of modes have long wavelength gap list expectations over the degenerate back, uh, the ground state. And they are derivative coupled due to a shift symmetry. And the effective actions of number of bosons are dependent on both the full symmetry group G in the UV and the unbroken group H is in the infrared. This is just what we learned in the past four decades. So now, uh, let me just, uh, uh, given you know, I spent all this time telling you what we learned in the past four decades, let me just, again, tell you something that people actually knew all the time, but they just, we don't usually say it in, 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 in this way, but I want to say it in, in this way so that, so that you know, I will make my arguments later that to follow more easily. So let me talk about something that, usually not emphasized in textbook, recall that, it, again, going back to this max can have potential. The ground state is this circle. And as I told you, the ground state is characterized by uh, a, a continuous parameter alpha that could be, the, you know, essentially tells you where on this circle your ground state is uh, sitting. So now I'm gonna bring in quantum mechanics, okay? What do I mean when I say, oh, I don't bring quantum mechanics? So in quantum mechanics, we learn the superposition of state, okay? So in principle, you can construct a ground state that is a superposition of state of all the, uh, the, the ground states in this circle, okay? So if you construct a particular uh, a ground state by taking superposition like this, that is superposition of all these uh, 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 states at the bottom, then you see right away that this state 
is actually invariant under rotation. And it's the superposition of ground states, so this state has the same energy as all the, the other states sitting at the bottom of the potential. So the question is, why couldn't this be the ground state of your system? Because you know, in this way, you could just construct a ground state that is invariant under the full symmetry of the system. Okay, so why could this be the ground state of, of your system? Because in this case, there would be no a spontaneous symmetry breaking as we learned. That spontaneous breaking always occurs when the ground state is not invariant under the full symmetry of the system. But this could have been a ground state that is invariant under the full symmetry group of the system. Okay, so why could it be the ground state? So, this shows that the important ingredient for spontaneous symmetry breaking that people don't usually emphasize is the vacuum superselection rule. That is, you know, for any emission local operator, the matrix of an element between two, two different ground state labeled by alpha and alpha prime must be zero. Okay? This must happen in order for your ground state to have a unique, to carry a unique alpha. Because if this doesn't happen, that means that you, you should be able to form a ground state by integrating over all these uh, alpha. So this super, a vacuum super selection rule is an important ingredient for the spontaneous symmetry breaking to happen, okay? And an intuitive way to understand why there has to be a super a, a, a selection rule is the following. When your ground state is a particular uh, 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 alpha prime, that means you know, at every point in space, your ground state is pointing at a particular direction on this circle at the bottom of the potential, okay? So a different ground state means at the, uh, a different uh, at, at the every point in, in the space time your ground the, the, your system is pointing at a different direction uh, in, in, in this, uh, every point in space time and the total energy the energy cost to flip the, the uh, ground state from the alpha direction everywhere to a different direction in your system should be roughly speaking proportional to the size of the system and. If the system has an infinite volume, that means the energy cost to flip your ground state at every point in space-time is infinite. And therefore, this cannot happen. Okay, that's sort of a, 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 an intuitive way to understand uh, why there has to be a super selection rule. So this also tells you that spontaneous symmetry breaking only occurs for a system with infinite volume. It has to be infinite volume, and then you have super selection rule, then spontaneous symmetry breaking happens. Okay. But on the other hand, a local excitation, if you where you only flip the direction in a sub-region of your total system, costs only finite energy, and therefore they ought to exist. And but these are precisely the Nabu boson interactions. That the local excitation of uh, changing the ground state of your system uh, from one one point to another, that is precisely the gapless excitation of Nabu boson. So an important consequence of this super selection rule on the scattered amplitude of the Nabu boson is that this implies that any S matrix of the element involving a soft pion or a soft boson where the boson momentum goes to zero must vanish. Okay? Uh, the, again, an intuitive way to see this, uh, again, going back to quantum mechanics. When we have a momentum eigenstate, the wave function of momentum eigenstate is just plain wave, e to the i dot, k dot x. Okay? So if you go to the zero momentum limit, that tells you that the zero momentum eigenstate has a constant wave function. The wave function is constant everywhere in your system. Okay? So that means that this zero momentum ion could actually flip the direction of the ground state everywhere in the system because the, you know, it had just has a flat wave function. So the zero momentum pion allows you to, flat, uh, to move you from one vacuum to another. Another way of saying is that if you have a zero momentum pion acting on a particular vacuum alpha, when you take the momentum of the pion to zero, this should move you to a different vacuum alpha prime. That's what a constant uh, wave function that uh, will give you. 
So this implies if I have an S matrix element where my in state is whatever in state plus a zero momentum prior, excited with respect to a particular uh, vacuum alpha, this, I should be able to view this as all these incoming particles excited with respect to a different vacuum alpha prime without the zero momentum prime. Okay? And therefore, when you have a matrix element uh, between an outgoing state and incoming state containing a zero momentum prime, this is, you can view this as an in state excited with respect to a vacu vacuum alpha prime sandwiched with an outgoing state excited with respect to a different vacuum. Therefore, the super selection rule will tell you immediately that this matrix element has to be zero. Okay? Yes. So, it turns out this property of the number goes on scattering amplitude is derived in a different fashion in the contact pions in Orange QCD by Steve Adler back in the 1960s. And nowadays it's known as the Adler zero condition to say that you know, if you take the boson uh, a, a, a momentum to, to zero, then you should get your scattering amplitude should vanish. And roughly speaking, again, this is equivalent to saying that boson boson are directly coupled. So in fact, in a, a QFT, you can show rigorously that the L0 condition, that all the S metric element containing a soft pion goes to zero, as a pion momentum goes to zero. You can show rigorously that this follows directly from the shift symmetry acting on the Nambu Gotham bosom, just by plugging in into the, uh, 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 in, to derive the conserved current corresponding to the shift symmetry that gives you this L0 condition. And so, so for this kind of study of uh, the soft limit, soft behavior of scattering amplitude, that is when you take the one external momentum to zero, uh, this kind of soft limit of uh, the scattering amplitudes is a very old subject. You know, people studied this for QED and gravity back in the 1920s. And for Nampu Boson Boson, this is the, uh, 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 the, the implied by the other zero condition that if you take the one external momentum to zero, it should go to zero as the external momentum goes to zero. And in recent years, there is a growing community of theorists working on scattering amplitudes. So one of the goals is to define a PFT not by Antonian Lagrangian, but instead by its scattering amplitude. Okay? So this raises the question, can, can we construct the nabu boson interaction just by imposing the other zero condition on the scattering amplitude? Okay, that's just the, the, the one of their, the, the goals they're trying to do. Can you define the QFT by the soft limit of the scattering, of its scattering amplitude? And in the case of Nabu Boson, he said, can I define any theory that has, a, as a, whose a, a scattering amplitude has other zero condition as a theory of Nabu Boson interactions? Okay. And this turned out that uh, to be a very powerful constraint the other zero condition, and it allows us to construct the complete Nambu Boson interaction without ever referring to a particular symmetry group G in the uh, 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 ultraviolet. Just to, to use one example to demonstrate how this works. Okay, let's start with a, a, a suppose you have four a, a, a mod, uh, n scalars, and let's start. You want to look at the, uh, the, the simplest uh, uh, four-point amplitude among all these scalars. And you want, you want to impose the other zero condition on this uh, four-part amplitude. And first of all, let me assume that there is some notion of ordering among the Nambu bosons. For example, there could be a flavor quantum number among these Nambu bosons. Then, you now here I'm taking, uh, a, looking at a flavor order of scattering amplitude. So when you start with a four-point amplitude and you impose that these external particles are on shell and there's a total moment of conservation, it turns out that you can write down the unique four-point amplitude that satisfies at a zero condition. In the sense that when you take each external momentum to zero, the amplitude vanishes. It doesn't uh, take too much to convince yourself that the, the unique uh, amplitude subject to the, this uh, total momentum conservation is just P2 plus that P4 with some arbitrary coefficient C and some mass scale F. Okay? And P2 that P4 again by 
by momentum conservation is P1 and P3. And as you can see, when you take any other, any one of the external momenta to zero, the amplitude vanishes. But this doesn't fix what C is, it doesn't fix what F is. Okay. And again, some observation is that first there is no constant term in the amplitude, because you want the add a zero. And the notion of order, as I say, can be achieved by assigning a discrete quantum number. And F is a dimension for parameter, while C is just some arbitrary number. Therefore, you can absorb just C, C into the definition of F, and you will never see it again. Okay. So now you have the four-point amplitude. What are you going to do next is to go to six-point amplitude. And quantum mechanics, again, ensures that when you have such a four-point amplitude, there must be <coughs> contribution to the six-point amplitude coming from the four-point vertex that we just fix using L of zero condition. And when you do that, you, you, write, you find that you get these three contributions to the six-point amplitude. And using the four-point vertex, you fix uh, uh, from the other zero condition. This is the, the contribution to the six-point amplitude, where this P square is just the propagator here in the middle. Okay. So when you do this, you find that this amplitude does not satisfy other zero condition. In the sense that if you take one, any one of the external momentum to zero, this amplitude doesn't vanish. Okay. So what do you do now? The easiest way is to add a new contribution to the six-point amplitude such that the total contribution to the six-point amplitude satisfies L as zero condition. And this new contribution cannot come from the four-point vertex. Therefore, it can only be a six-point uh, contact interaction. So we use the L as zero condition to fit the value of this six-point uh, 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 vertex. It turns out that this uniquely determines the value of this six-point contact interaction by requiring the six-point amplitude satisfy zero at a zero condition. Okay. So this process can be continued to eight-point amplitude and so on and so forth. So in the end, you just have to trust me for it that all tunable amplitudes of number boson can be reconstructed simply by assuming first there's a notion of order among these uh, bosons. Second is that the L0 condition has to be satisfied by the scattering amplitude of these particles. And that allows you to reconstruct the, the full Nabu boson interaction without ever knowing what is a group G in the infrared. Unless one is interested in the absolute normalization of F. And so I, I must say that the, this problem was initiated by Saskan and Fry back in 1969 up to eight point. And, and Cliff Chong and company, they completed the program to order in the final di using five, uh, for, in terms of final diagrams uh, back in the 16. And we came to this subject by completing the shift symmetry, the, those ta 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 terms that was left out by CCWZ. But in the end, they're all equivalent stuff. And here, just to show you that, you know, uh, uh, if you tell me what is, uh, 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 how the boson transform under the unbroken group H, okay, then without the, uh, uh, knowing what the G is, we can write down the full effective action of these uh, Nambu boson boson. Just, this just very simple expression that you can write down. So we have discovered the following universality, that given different broken group G in the UV, Nambu bosons carrying the same infrared data would have identical interactions up to the normalization of F. Okay? And so going back to this earlier example that I showed you, you know, when you start from take SU2 by U1, you get the one complex bosons. You uh, take SU5 minus U5, you get another complex bosons. And I was telling you that their interaction should be universal up to normalization of F. Okay? So indeed, when you take these two effective action, you make F go to 4F in the first case, you recover the effective action of the second case, order by order in the F. Okay? So this is the modern perspective on the Nampu Boson Boson. That is, the L0 can be taken as a defining property of Nambu bosons. Moreover, it's a consequence of the vacuum superselection rule. 
And there is a universality uh, class for each number goes on carrying the same charge under the uh, Borman group. Moreover, the nonlinearity in the number goes on interactions arise entirely from infrared physics. It has nothing to do with what's being broken in the, in the G, other than determining the normalization of F. OK? So, so very quickly, since I'm running out of time, let me just uh, tell you what is this good for? What is this universality good for? Uh, it turns out that we all know that there is this uh, class of theory called the uh, composite Higgs model, where the Higgs arises as a pseudo number boson boson. Here, I'm showing you a table of the review written by Ch uh, Chava, which uh, one So. This is a table from a review he wrote back in 14. And he showed you all these different composite Higgs models. They are all based on different G mod H. And I'm sure by now, Chava probably added another 20 models to this table. Okay. But the point is that all these models, they differ in the G and H. However, in all these viable models, okay, they all, the H always contains an SO4 subgroup, where under which the Higgs, the 125 GV Higgs, transform as a fundamental representation under the SO4. Okay? So, so in all these models, if they are viable in the sense that they are, uh, you know, they, they, they are not ruled out by the T prime already, the approach group always contains the same infrared data, that is the SO4, and the 125 GV Higgs is a four SO4. So the universality implies that the multi Higgs coupling in this model to two electrically gauge photons are universal, regardless of their G and H. Okay? That's what the universality is good for. Just to show you explicitly, so if you write down this class model, if you write, this is the leading two digit Lagrangian, if you write down how the Higgs couple to the W and Z, here is the multi Higgs coupling to the, the, the pair W and Z, all these coefficients P1H, P2H, P3H, P4H, etc. It turns out they are all related to each other and they are all controlled by a single parameter to C that is related to the normalization of F. And this is a manifestation of the fact that there is an underlying shift to the tree view relating all these multi Higgs couplings to a pair of W's in Z. Okay. So that means the one way to detect the presence of the shift symmetry is to measure the one Higgs coupling to two V's as well as two Higgs coupling to two V's and see if they are controlled by the same parameter to C. If they are, that, that's how we detect the presence of this uh, nonlinear shift symmetry. And just to give you some example, here I write out all the prediction, the prediction of all these composite Higgs model of uh, one Higgs coupling to two Z, one Z and photon, and two Higgs coupling to two Z and one Z and photon. So it turns out the coefficients of this operator are all related to each other by a single parameter to C. So that means if we can measure the coefficient of this uh, 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 operator, then we can test whether they are all related by a single parameter. So we can test whether there is an underlying shift symmetry. Okay. So here, just to give you some, this is already the last slide. So more, uh, the, the HVD coupling has been measured to death at the LC11. It turns out that HHVD coupling had not been uh, talked about too much at the LC. And so here, just to show you how we can uh, uh, start looking at the HHVD coupling, uh, is through the VPF going to the di Higgs, or in the laptop fighter, it could be the WW fusion E plus E minus going to two neutrino with two Higgs. We can do an associate production of double Higgs with a vector boson, or an offshore Higgs decay to one Higgs and two V. So this would offer us the opportunity to measure the HHVV coupling in the future. And these are the rates, and in my mind, this is the future frontier of precision heat physics. 
So concluding remarks, effective action on number goes on defined entirely by the inferred properties in, independent of broken group G. And this uh, consideration opened up new uh, values for future theoretical exploration. For example, what about the Gosson bosons for non-relativistic system? And what is the analog of L0 for non-relativistic Nabucco Gosson system? And what about uh, uh, spontaneously broken space-time symmetries and so on and so forth? And interaction of Nabucco Gosson Higgs with two gauge bosons are dictated by shift symmetries and are universal regardless of what's being broken in the UV. And testing the ship symmetry in Higgs coupling could drive future experimental programs in the study of the Higgs model. Okay, I'll stop here. Okay. I need to start to revise my textbook. Any questions? Presumably this will be good for this That That goes to... Uh, Okay, you use the microphone. microphone. It comes from the space time. Microphone. Can you repeat the question on the microphone? Oh, so I was asking if this would work just uh, out of the box for uh, the case of pivotal as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I. I well, it's the conformal symmetry. That's, yes, that's but uh, I've, all I'm saying is that. I imagine you can, if you can find a very large space-time symmetry group where you contain a, 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 a dilaton, then, then yes, I believe it should work out of the past. Yeah. I have another question. Okay, okay. okay just one more. So, so presumably this actually works very well for three-level amplitudes, right? So, but you know that we should consider loops as well when we talk about the circles and the loops. Uh, so, so this is the case. I'll go back to re I'll, I'll go back to the case of a uh, chiral Lagrange. Okay, in chiral Lagrange, people have completely loop correction to chiral Lagrange. Okay, however, the nonlinear structure of all these like uh, Alfred in the uh, in the theoretic uh, uh, accounting is not spoiled by the loop correction because there is an underlying shift symmetry. That's correct. Right, right. So, so in principle, you could pursue that program here as well. I mean, I think my question is more related to uh, your final part. Then. The final part, when you talk about these uh, experimental measurements to verify these relations, I mean, don't you think that those things will be modified by by the loop corrections? I I, I understand what you're all I'm saying is that those are under. We have tools to deal with that question. That's what I'm saying. So uh, you know, if if we do have a machine in the future that would get to this kind of precision. Then a program to pursue the uh, loop correction, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm sure we'll have it just like in the same case of for Kara. I, I seem to see another question. So, um, in other theory like EBI, there are the da 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 part. Uh, yes. So, uh, can we use the same target to determine the the, 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 the theory? Yeah, yes, the answer is yes. I think my student wrote a paper a, a month ago. <laughs> so I just want to understand the statement more uh, precisely. So in that big table with all the different models, what what can be different about them? That, um, all the G's could be different. All the H would also be different. And you could also have more goals on than other than the 125 GBX. Yeah, so I guess if you just care about the 125 GBX, right. uh, and then its interactions with the standard model particles. With, with the electric gauge bosons, let me be precise. OK, with the electric right. gauge bosons. Yeah. So not the fermions. Not the fermions. OK. Right. Then the statement is that the, the 125 GBX interaction with with the two gauge ball, electric gauge ball in this table yeah. are identical up to normalization of that. That's the same. But then the interaction with top partners and things like that, that's a whole different story. That's a whole different story. Yeah, because those, uh, if those interactions usually break the ship's image. Okay. I'm looking for interactions that are preserved by the ship's image. Is there any higher order effect that matters where you have explicit shift symmetry breaking and that realizes itself. Right, so, so, so of course, once you have a, a shift symmetry breaking, that should, should feed into your, your Lagrangian either through, through, through loop or, or, or by 
any more time in your CCW. But again, those who know how to deal with just like the quad mass break out of symmetry, who will know how to incorporate quad masses in parallel Please. In this uh, table here, is the symmetry G really exact or like in Python? Uh, it's more exact. Like the G, right? Is it exact symmetry or is it a uh, like Python? It's not possibly focused. It's a classmate, uh, that's what they will. So once you bring the, the, uh, a Fermion max out, for example, and the, this the, the, the heat modify it. Uh, if we modify at a higher order, this is a true, and, and without those effects, it's a... Uh, right, so, so, but, but, but yeah, but, but those effects will be down, further suppressed by a loop factor compared to the effect I'm talking about. Yeah. That's one. If we, as I say, if we ever get to that kind of precision, then we would have to improve these higher order effects, which is true in any EMT, which is actually <coughs> We commented on uh, the same lines. This, because these relations are also based on the assumption that there is only one heat tablet, right? right? And it doesn't mix with any other of these PNGDs. Right. But mixing or maybe more. Right, so, so let me, let me, yes. Uh, let me comment on that. So, so, of course, you can ask what happens when you have two heat tablets. Uh, and, and the statement is that uh, uh, those interactions, this particular interaction, in fact, are not. Uh, are modified by that. And, and the, the argument is more involved, but, but I'm happy to talk offline. Anything else? And that's, I think, yeah, for the stimulating talk.